Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, and I'll be your moderator. Today, we're joined by Dr. Sarah Jockin, as she will address the physical and mental stresses in your dental practice. If anyone has questions, please add them to the Q&A section, and we'll answer them at the end. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation, live or on demand, and this webinar is sponsored by ADAC. Dr. Jockin, welcome. Thank you so much, Adam, for this uh, introduction. Welcome, everyone. I'm delighted you are joining me today to discuss wellness in the dental office. I um, am very honored to be asked to give this webinar. This is a huge uh, area of passion of mine. Uh, I do enjoy practicing clinical dentistry. I do that two days a week. And then I really enjoy teaching, uh, whether it's in the university setting or webinars like this or private um, I just really enjoy it. And another huge area of passion of mine is wellness. Um, I am director of wellness for Heartland Dental, uh, spearheading the first wellness program for dentists that I'm aware of in the industry. And then I also like to beta test and try new products in the area of CAD CAM and implantology. Before we get started today, I would like to rate, have you rate your own level of stress um, think about this past month, maybe the last 30 days, and decide what applies best to you. You can opt something on the screen here and then hit submit. And um, I will put mine in. How stressed were you last month? <laughs> it's actually not letting me vote. Host and oh. panelists cannot vote. So I'll give you a couple seconds to choose what would um, apply to you. And then later on, we'll actually use that number to, uh, to see how you rate overall. And Adam, I think that we can actually give a distribution of our listeners if we want to um, mm -hmm. and show them where they might lie. And yep. what the responses are still, they're still coming in, but early returns are showing that 56% of you uh, had severe stress really in the last month. well i'm especially interested in the number or percentage of people that vote number four or five okay yep so 57 percent number four and 11 percent number five wow that's good to know okay well thank you for doing that so today we are here i have a little bit of a delay here and in... oh there we go today we are here to find out what the common stressors are in the field of dentistry and what the unique situations are we are exposed to as dentists and team members that trigger stress and non-well-being, right? Um, I will briefly discuss my own experience and then talk about what burnout means and then give you specific interventions that you can use to find your path to wellness. Um, we'll spend a chunk of time on the interventions because that's really where the rubber hits the road. And which will be interesting to you. Okay, so for me, it started back when in 2011, my, my own dental journey um, where I started my own office. My son, Victor, who you see on the right here was three years old at the time. And actually this picture of my team that you see in front of you was taken about six months into it when I had already earned my second assistant and a hygienist. For the first six months I was doing my own cleaning. So I started with two ladies, one in the front and one in the back. And we had grown and um, I had basically three governing, let's say, philosophies that um, I applied to my own dental office that I started from scratch. One was clinical excellence, right? You have to make sure that your dentistry is rock solid. That's kind of without any questions. And then to me, the customers had to have a VIP experience, whether it was calling my patients before I ever met them or um, really making sure that they felt that they were the most important person in the office to calling them after treatment and that experience. And I wanted to use technology to kind of achieve the first two. And to me, that I considered that the patient first philosophy. And um, just to give you an idea of how I grew the office, I'll go through this quickly. But I started because I was very interested in implants. I started my journey with uh, investing in CVCT technology so I could see everything three dimensionally. That made sense to me. And then when the Omnicam at the time came out, um, I invested in chair-side milling, which of course by now were upgraded to the fantastic prime scan that I use in the office. And to just give same day crowns and restorations to people. And it surprised me how important that was for patients, getting their restoration same day and not having to come back. 
And then as I evolved in my dentistry, um, I invested more in, uh, uh, in a five axis milling machine to be able to do my whole frameworks um, for my full arch implant work. And then also uh, rounded that out with uh, investing in printing technology to just be able to make everything in house and be able to have that seamless workflow that my patients really appreciate it. And just to give you an idea of, of the dentistry, uh, we were able to, to deliver with that. This is Bill and Bill came in and he had a terminal dentition on the upper arch. This is a big bridge. He's missing teeth number seven through 10. And if you look here um, in the impression tooth number 11, which is on the bottom there broke. And so now this big bridge, which was most of his teeth was only supported by two teeth on the one side. So he knew he needed to do something. He didn't want to go into a dentistry, never wanted to have anything removable or palatal coverage. So we imaged him with uh, the intraoral scanner and then also with the CT. And then I was able to overlay that. And so Bill drives far. He drives about two hours to come see me. And so it was important to him that he had as few uh, visits as possible. Convenience is a real big deal for our patients. And so I was able with all this technology to now go ahead and make my immediate denture myself. Um, this is a case I treated in late 2018 um, and set it up properly. I even made a guide. Oh, this is a CERT guide too. They made an in-lab on the right-hand side. And so when Bill comes back for his second visit, we have these things ready where we have the immediate denture. In this case, this was a monolithic that was characterized. I do it a little differently now. Um, and then the clear duplicate, which we have a trough cut into uh, in order to guide our prosthetics and also our implants during surgery. Um, this duplicate has two good reasons or uh, uses. Um, first, it tells me if I have my occlusive clearance after the alveoplasty, as you see here. And then also, once I have the implants placed, it allows me to see how I need to orient my multi-unit abutments so that I have occlusal or lingual um, emergence access paths. Um, and that allows me to now retrofit with confidence. And since I have a palette in the upper, I'm able to just see that, retrofit it. You can see here just by myself, two-handedly. And then um, Bill, after a couple hours, leaves with this temporary in place and, um, and ready to enjoy life with his fixed teeth. Now, three months later, Bill comes back and, and we take an impression of what he now has um, and the healed gums. And with that, we can, again, in-house make a prototype of the final restoration, which you see on the left side here that's printed. And um, you can see his tissue healed really nicely. And then we can duplicate that in the final, which in this case is a peak framework with Emax crowns. And, um, and that allows for literally a four visit full arch patient workflow, uh, which makes patients super happy because what they need is to be able to come in and be done and uh, kind of fit dentistry around their busy life, right? So with that philosophy of clinical excellence and employing the VIP experience and leveraging the technology, I found that we grew a lot and uh, we needed to expand. So uh, we found, this is my husband and Victor now at 2015 is uh, seven years old and our dog then moves. We found this property and the property we're standing on right here is where we built our dream practice. Uh, we built this building from scratch, 11 operatories, 5,000 square feet with its own in-house lab. And of course, with that expansion came a new wish list of things to do. Um, I wanted to have lots of space and have the office kind of represent the type of dentistry we offered and, you know, clean lines, modern, welcoming, open, spacious. Same for my surgical suites, you know, operatories where we have room for a loved one to sit or maybe after sedation for somebody to recover here. And so with, of course, the office grew the team a little bit. So this is... Uh, our team of uh, usually somewhere between 24 and 26 uh, men and women. Um, and, you know, if you look on the outside, it was a huge success, right? We have this growth over time and here we are and the production increases and everything seemed really amazing on the outside. And it was. Um, but at the same time, I was wondering why I was feeling like this often. Um, stressed. Um, almost feeling like the growth was too much. I was feeling overburdened um, and I felt like I couldn't keep up. Um, so it really led me to research this because I knew that in order for everything to go well, I also had to be well. And that was kind of a moment of reckoning that approached me right before COVID hit actually. 
And so I want to talk to you about burnout briefly, because burnout is a phenomenon that um, is a recent discovery. Well, 1974 is when a psychologist first coined the term. And I think that this his description of it is really accurate. And I think it's worth reading. Um, so the burned out candidate has a feeling of exhaustion, being unable to shake a lingering cold, suffering from frequent headaches and GI disturbances sleeplessness, shortness of breath. The burnout candidate finds it just too difficult to hold in feelings. He cries too easily, the slightest pressure makes him feel overburdened, and he yells and he screams. And with this ease of anger may come a suspicious attitude, a kind of suspicion and paranoia. The victim begins to feel that just about everyone is out to screw him. He becomes the house cynic. Anything that is suggested is bad wrapped or bad mouthed. And so let's uh, let's look at the literature about burnout a little bit. Um, there's a lot that has been written in the literature, and I want to just drive your attention to this one author, who's uh, Dr. Maslach, and she is um, a wonderful author who has authored many books. The most notable I find are Burnout and the Truth About Burnout. And in those books, she is um, describing just what it means to be burnt out. And burnout has three dimensions. The first one is the physical and the emotional exhaustion. The second one is cynicism. And the third one is the ineffectiveness. So let's talk about the first one. Um, often with dentists, it, it manifests as pain. And if you think about it, um, whether you're a dentist or a dental team member, you probably know a dentist or two or a team member or two that have pain somewhere. Whether it's the neck, the arms, the back, you may have a hard time finding somebody who's never had those issues while they've been in the dental field. So, so pain is a common factor that we need to absolutely address. You know, that's one of those things that we do for our patients, actually. Um, they can result in tension, headaches, or migraines. Um, you may have trouble sleeping. Some people have a hard time falling asleep. Some people have a hard time staying asleep. Some people wake up really early in the morning and have big trouble going back to sleep. Um, you may also have become, um, it may become difficult to gain or to lose weight. Some people, when they're stressed, they start eating, others, they stop eating. And you may notice some weight changes that might not be due to your diet. Well, it will be due to your diet, but it, the underlying cause may really be burnout. Um, the feeling of being overwhelmed, of not ever being able to catch up, um, which may cause depression and anxiety and, in severe cases, suicidal thoughts. Then the cynicism, the second dimension of burnout, which is basically a feeling that nothing really matters so much anymore. You're starting to take a distant attitude towards work and people, which may be more pronounced at work, but it may also be more pronounced at home. Um, I found that myself, I was keeping things together pretty well at the practice in front of my patients, but... When I came home, I was letting it out on my, my husband and son and family um, just because I felt safe to do it. And to my um, uh, defense, it is a protection mechanism to cope with the exhaustion that you're feeling because you're just so overwhelmed. At some point, you're shutting down. And maybe if you don't care, then it'll all be okay. Um, and then the ineffectiveness. Because you are overwhelmed, you will become less effective. But also the work may seem less meaningful. Maybe um, it doesn't matter so much anymore. There's overlap here. And then also feeling maybe that you're not able to do it, that you're incompetent, that you're inadequate, um, which is a really dangerous combination, actually. And then those hurdles, they become terribly big and insurmountable. Um, I remember uh, my husband just asking me to pick up dinner on the way home. And to me, just the fact that I had to figure out where I was going to go, find parking, go in, stand in line, wait, figure out what everybody needed so I could order it. It just seemed so overwhelming. That was a wake-up call for me because I thought, my goodness, it's not that hard to pick up dinner on the way home. Um, what's sad is that we also now are not able to take care of our patients as much because medical error surely does increase with burnout. So how prevalent is it, right? If you feel like I'm talking to you with this and this applies to you, um, you are, unfortunately, in really good company in the dental field. There has been some research done 
um, the Mayo Clinic took an interest in this in the medical field years ago. And they partnered with, or they uh, conceived of a company that's called the Wellbeing Index. And the idea was to assess physicians, medical students, nurses, other healthcare employees, and see how they were doing. So in 2019, they collected almost 60,000 assessments. And um, some of these are repeat assessments. And so they surveyed a total of over 12,000 physicians and almost 4,000 nurses. And here's what they found. They found, now look at the bottom of the screen first. So the number of physicians assessed was 12,000. The percentage of physicians at high level of distress was 40%. And they, number four, number five, if you rated yourself at number four, number five, you are considered a high level of distress. Now, what does that mean? That means you're at a five times higher risk of burnout than your peers who do not report that high level of stress. That means you're at a four times increased risk of experiencing severe fatigue, which means you may actually fall asleep while you're supposed to stay awake at a traffic light or something like that. A three times higher risk of having a poor overall quality of life. Now, think about that for a second. We went to dental school. We went through all these hoops. We invested a ton of money with the promise that we would be able to help people. And guess what? Have a good quality of life. We didn't do all of this to have a poor overall quality of life. This is a really important one. Also, it puts you at a twice increased risk of committing a medical error and also of having suicidal thoughts. That's a big deal. These numbers are very alarming. Nurses kind of fare the same, a smaller sample size, about the same, maybe a little bit worse outcomes. And they did this study again in 2020, and the numbers are remarkably similar. Now, COVID hit, right? It gave us all a little bit of a reset button. And what I noticed when I really sat down and had this, this lockdown, I thought, oh my goodness, we all know this. A year is 365 days, right? That's a lot of days, but think about 10 years or 50 years. Let's say 50 years. I'm, I'm in my 40s. I'm hoping to live another 50 years. And so I have about 20,000 days left. And that's a lot of days, but let's make a money analogy. $20,000 is a lot of money. I think everybody would agree with that. But if that's all you had left, if that was your last money to spend, I think we would all agree that we would be very careful with every dollar we spend. Now think about it. If you have 20,000 days left and that's all you have, wouldn't you really want to spend each day to its fullest, right? And that led me to rethink my philosophy a little bit. And that led me to think maybe you should put yourself first. And guess what? We can take a little analogy from the heart because the heart, you could argue, is one of the most important organs in the body, right? It supplies everything with fresh blood from the lungs. But guess what? The very first artery that comes away from this huge aorta or aorta is the pulmonary artery. So the heart supplies itself with the most oxygen-rich blood first because it knows if it can't take care of itself and it suffers, the rest of the body suffers also. So put yourself first and guess what? Put your team second because you interface with your team so much more than you interface with your patients. They are so instrumental to your success. Losing a team member is a lot more dramatic than losing a patient. And if you think about it, in the first week being back in January, you spend more time with your team members that week than you likely will spend with any of your patients the entire year. So put yourself first, put your team second, and then put your patients third. It's still means that we're going to have clinical excellence and the VIP technology, the VIP experience and to leverage technology to achieve those. But that doesn't necessarily mean that patients are first. Put yourself first. So Bill Flader, who is a mentor of mine and has a fantastic blog out, is very active. He talks a lot about dentist wellness and burnout. And he says there are three different, very important factors here. First, we have to recognize how we're doing. We have to measure with, for example, a tool like the well-being index that they used for the nurses and physicians, which actually is just a nine question survey that you can take. And it's free and it's online. I will give you a link at the end. 
first you have to recognize what, what the issue is. Then you have to identify what you can do about it to solve it, to get yourself be better, to get yourself be balanced and unburdened. And then you have to communicate that and to, to access those resources. And he makes an interesting point. He talks about why dentists are likely to or prone to be burnt out. And he states that dentistry attracts people with certain personalities and, and attitudes towards life. And not all of them are extremely flattering, but I, what I want to focus on is perfectionism, because I would say you're almost mm, going to be miserable if you're not going to be a perfectionist as a dentist, because who cares about quarter millimeter margins? Well, the dentists do, and they have to, because if they're open, then it's not going to work, right? So our, our profession almost selects for those individuals who are perfectionists. But let's think about another thing. Let's think about what our daily expectations are in the dental office. What do we expose ourselves to every day? Well, let's, let's think about it. First of all, you're always multitasking, right? Because you're always running multiple columns at a time. You might have just one operative column, but you likely have a hygiene column. Or you may have a post-object low production column. You might have a new patient column. I know, I know dentists who run six columns at a time. I know dentists who are very fancy, who only run two columns at a time. But you're constantly multitasking. So while you're doing one thing, in the back of your mind, you're managing another thing, which is stressful inherently. Then you have to empathize with your patients and all kinds of patients, right? Who are in pain and not always in the best mood and don't always want to be there. <laughs> and you have to deal with all kinds of different personality types. Uh, you might have the dominant patient who just comes in and marches in and tells you what to do. You might have the very unsure patient that just can never make up their mind and you know what they need and you tell them and they just won't say yes. Or you might have the patient that's really needy and whiny, which is what I struggle with a lot, um, who just needs the reassurance maybe. But you have to switch from one mode to another based on who you are confronted with. Then you have to diagnose and treatment plan with extremely high accuracy, right? This is a malpractice issue. Like, don't you miss something, doctor? And maybe worse yet, don't you overprescribe? You have to find that golden middle that is the standard of care and not too much. So there's a lot of pressure to find things, but not overreact to things that you find clinically. Then you have to perform some impeccable surgeries, right? And we are all surgeons, whether you do fancy work or not. Um, somebody who does a, a, a filling performs surgery, right? We anesthetize we keep a clean environment, we, uh, we remove uh, human tissue, um, we reconstruct tooth structure, that's surgery. And you're doing all of this while you're doing the other stuff. And then you have to like squeeze in some hygiene checks and lead your team, right? You have to also be the, the leader of our, of our very highly trained team um, that has to function extremely well to keep the schedule on time. You have to run a profitable business despite everything that's getting thrown at you. And then at the same time, sometimes you have to be an equipment repair person because, and Dr. Gropper says this nicely, you have to do all of this at once. You have to be the, have the eyes of an artist. You have to have the hands of a surgeon, the insights of a therapist, the tact of a diplomat, the reasoning of a scientist, the skills of a business person, and the experience of a dental equipment repair person. That's a lot. It makes me tired just thinking about it. So now that we know this, right, uh, let's think about what we can do about it. Dentistry is a stressful profession, yes, but can we create a situation where we can function within it in a, in a highly efficient way without sacrificing our own sanity? So let's look at that. I'll go a little bit slower now because um, we still have good time. So the interventions I want to talk about there's the physical fitness to address the physical issues that come with dentistry. There's the emotional fitness that we always want to foster of balance, of internal balance, mental, emotional balance. And then there's how we fit work into life or how we um, enjoy life at work. And then your support structure, right? Let's talk about your family at home. Let's talk about your family at work. So for physical fitness, um, I had to change my scheduling a little bit and it made a big difference. I decided to not ever go to work feeling stiff or unwell. I had to start the morning right. 
So I actually get up a half hour earlier and I stretch. Um, I take this time to myself to be able to focus and give myself the attention that I need. Um, you can combine the physical fitness with the mental and you will find a lot of overlap anyway uh, in this time. And the pause is really important. I find that heat in the morning is good. So I um, loosen up everything that might be stiff. Then in the evening, I find that icing is a good idea because those muscles that are now strained from the ergonomically contorted position get a chance to relax. You want that um, heat and, uh, and inflammation that comes with it pulled out of those muscles. So um, not everybody's the same, but that works for me. The one I struggle with most is to take breaks during the day because I almost feel like that building sucks me in and the day happens and then it spits me out at the end of the day. And I may have noticed afterwards that I just ran for 10 hours without a break. Uh, that is one where you really have to involve your team also holding you accountable. And sometimes it's hard to do that, but it is absolutely necessary. Uh, some stretches that you can do. Let me see if I have a... Um, some stretch, every stretch or workout that you want to do has to focus on counteracting the contorted position we're in. What that means is you want to counteract the shortening of the front where we slouch forward and the twisting, and you want to strengthen the back muscles so that we open up and that we, um, strengthen our back to contract and bring our chins and necks back. Um, so any exercise you do in that direction is good. If you're a gym enthusiast, you know that back day is important. Um, if you're a yoga enthusiast, uh, you know uh, a bunch of different wonderful exercises that will help you. Um, in order to really see your progression, um, I recommend that you actually keep a wellness log to yourself. Um, the reason why that's important is that not only do you acknowledge what you've done for yourself and relive that experience, you can also track small changes over time. I don't know if you do any um, ortho, but sometimes people feel like their teeth aren't moving. And then it's really helpful to have that impression with the intraoral um, scanner to, to show them how the teeth have moved. And it may be a little bit, but it really gives them uh, good motivation to continue going and some positive reassurance. Uh, in the wellness log, uh, I see what I've done and then I actually find ways to treat myself, um, things that I do. I went for a walk today. Um, I took some time out and um, did some exercise or um, even I meditated. Um, write that down, track it, um, look at it and really insist that you get that downtime because it is easy to just help everybody else and make sure everybody else is okay and put yourself last. And if you write down in a wellness log what you've done and maybe what you're supposed to do every day, then you're more likely to follow through. And that's really helpful when you're a few weeks into it because in the beginning we have excitement, we find this new routine, we do this and we build it in and then it starts working. And because it's working, we stop doing it because we get distracted with the other things. And I'm sure that sounds familiar to some of you guys. Then do some balance movements. So I struggle with this physical aspect, not necessarily of the slouching as much, but the twisting, because I never sit at the 12 o'clock position. I'm a right-handed person. So I sit at like the 11 o'clock, maybe 1030 position. And then as the day goes on, I start creeping over, creeping over, and then there comes this twist. So that causes my psoas actually, which is the muscle that connects the upper thigh to your spine and is responsible for twisting, but also for lifting your knee up. The one-sided psoas starts locking up on me, which throws my back out of whack. So I have to try and twist the other way as much as I can because the body does like the balancing movements and it will help. It sounds like it's a, a, a little to do, but it actually over time has a big effect. So for example, little stuff, I brush my teeth with my left. And at first it takes forever. It's like writing with your left. Your body knows what to do. It knows what it should look like. It just doesn't, it can't quite execute it. So be ready to be really kind of um, banging into your own teeth and clumsy. But if you brush your teeth with your left side or with your off-handed side, 
what happens is your upper body slightly rotates in that position. And those muscles need to be challenged. They need to be re-engaged because they've been stretched going the other way for a long time. Also driving, I have now my left hand on the steering wheel and I really insist on that to get that shoulder rotation over to the other side. Household tasks. I don't wipe my kitchen counter with my right hand anymore. I'm really trying to become more ambidextrous with these mundane tasks that will put your body in a certain position and habituate you on that side. And then lastly, I do exams for my offhand side now. So what that means, I will literally switch to the left side of this chair in the one or two o'clock position as I do my extra oral intra oral exam. And what was amazing to me at first, when I would do the oral cancer screening, right? We look around lips, buccal mucosa, floor of mouth, palate. And then the palate would come and I literally could not see the palate because my neck wouldn't turn enough. And it just amazed me that my body was that crooked and locked in place. Um, I noticed that I, when I, we came back from our lockdown from COVID in May of 2020, that's when I started implementing these things. And it's amazing to me how after a while it becomes easy. Now I can see the palate without issues. And that's because my body has learned to go into that position habitually again. Um, I actually have even started uh, using my left hand for other things more in dentistry. Now I slowly incorporate that because obviously I don't want to just start drilling with my left hand. Um, but it is helping me become more balanced and feel better physically, which is so incredibly important. Um, I noticed when you start waking up with pain predictably every morning and you don't know if you're ever going to get rid of that pain, that's really hard on the psyche. It's hard to start your day when you're constantly in pain. It's difficult. And then don't hesitate to seek professional help. Just because you're a doctor doesn't mean you don't need a doctor. Um, see whatever works for you. The chiropractor might be the right answer for you. It may not. Maybe acupuncture is better for you. For me, osteopath um, treatments have been the most effective for my personal condition. And now you might, well, you might ask, what's an osteopath, right? I never heard of it before. Um, my dad enlightened me about that profession. He lives in Germany. It's much more common there. It's something between a physical therapist, a chiropractor, a massage therapist, and uh, and something else altogether. It's more gentle manipulation than the chiropractor. And um, it's been really helpful. Uh, also physical therapy on an ongoing session. You might need bracing support. For a while, I had a lumbar brace that really helped, um, but it may not help. Actually, one of the most significant helpful therapies for me has been massage. Uh, find a good therapist and do it for yourself. I do not skip a week because it is important that I invest in my own health there. And it can be a business expense if you are a private dentist, I believe. Um, and then emotional fitness, equally as important and very intertwined, right? Um, if we are emotionally unwell, then we are usually physically unwell too. And often the other way around too. So um, mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? Some people think of it as meditation, others of just being still, um, observing the current moment without reacting and observing it with a kind eye, um, taking breaks, um, stopping to just take it all in without passing immediate judgment or having a knee jerk reaction, which is difficult because we're in such a fast paced profession. Uh, we are go, 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 make a decision right away, get that treatment plan done, get it executed. Um, it's hard to be mindful. And you will probably go through phases where you're more mindful and it helps. And then again, because it helped, you stop doing it because things are better. And then you'll slip off again a little bit. So if you've tried it before, let this be your reminder to reinvigorate your, your passion for it or try it. Um, and really, it is as easy as sitting down and not engaging with your environment and just taking a breath, right? Then you become that observer. You don't need anything that, to do it. There's no hurdle for entry. You just do it. You can do it right now. You can do it in an hour. You can do it anytime, anywhere, any place. 
Then positive psychology and savoring. That's a really, really good one. Um, I love this one because it is intuitive and it is also very effective. So there's this book that um, was written, Learned Optimism. This is a, a must read, in my opinion. In the beginning, it's a little lengthy because he talks about uh, experiments on dogs. And first you wonder why all of this detail. And then later on, you realize in the book why. Um, Dr. Seligman is talking about how we as humans are programmed to look for the negative. That's just a survival instinct, right? Uh, what's wrong in my environment? How can I... Uh, improve things so that they are more conducive to long-term survival. But what that means is that sometimes we shut out the positive and we don't really give it the, the, the weight it deserves. Um, let's take an example. Let's say your boss comes in and gives you a review and they tell you four things that you're just excelling at above and beyond the expectations. You're doing great. It's fantastic. And then they give you a fifth thing, which is like this opportunity for improvement or however they might word it, where something isn't perfect, right? So now imagine you have a 30 minute drive home. Are you spending one fifth of your time on the drive home thinking about the negative and four fifths of your time driving home thinking about all the positive and giving yourself a pat on the shoulder? I wouldn't, you know, I would really kind of obsess about the negative and Think about how I could do better and maybe even scolding myself for coming short or being disappointed that I hadn't quite reached that goal. Well, let this be your reminder to say, hey, spend some time on the four things that you did fantastically. Just same in life, right? No, don't just think, okay, well, I expected that anyway. And, and you know, that was just what, what I needed to do and then move on. No. Do give yourself the time to congratulate yourself. Be proud of yourself. Tell yourself. And you know what? If you're in the car, it really helps to say it out loud. It sounds so silly, but it really does help. Just like, and I learned this recently, it really helps in the morning when you wake up and you look at that mirror image. You know what you should do next time? Give yourself a high five. Be kind. Be positive. And you might ask yourself, what am I giving myself a high five for? In the mirror, I'm serious. Like literally, high five yourself in the mirror. High five yourself for getting up. You don't need to achieve something to high five yourself. And the reason why high fiving is such a wonderful thing is because we have done it all of our lives. Everybody's high fived somebody before. And we've always felt really optimistic, positive, or supportive doing it. We don't ever high five somebody and tell them, oh, you look tired this morning. Oh, my God, your hair is so flat or you've just gotten these wrinkles or you've gained weight or whatever negative thing there is. You would never think that as you're high fiving yourself. So your brain is wired to give yourself a nice dose of positive hormones or some dopamine or something when you high five people. Well, high five yourself. You've, you're worth it. You know, you don't even need a reason. You don't need to earn it. Just be kind to yourself in the morning when you look at that person in the mirror, because you know what? That person just got up. <laughs> so that's a great reason to give yourself a high five. But so the positive psychology is dwell on the positive. Don't dwell on the negative. We do that. We ruminate around the negative. Dwell on the positive. So I used to downplay positive moments. Even A patient would be excited about their new smile. They'd be so happy with it. And I'd be like, oh, it's nothing. Oh, you know, like, no worries. And I'm almost telling them that there's no reason to rejoice. Well, that's terrible. Now I say, hey, you just make my day. You know, because they did. When somebody tells me their smile is awesome and I changed their life, that makes my day. That's why we're doing this. And I tell them that too. You know, your joy and, and, and your renewed confidence is why we're doing all of this. And you will find that those few moments, those brief moments of recognizing the positive will change your mood for the next, I don't know, minutes, hours, I don't know. Uh, it's worth it. You'll go into the next room with an extra spring in your step. And people will notice that. So misery seeks company. But you know what? Positive behavior does too. It's what you put out there. Then also really, really, really important. Know your limits, right? It's hard because sometimes we stretch our limits because we want to help others, for example. That's 
noble, but it's really dysfunctional if you extend your, go past your limits. And that doesn't help anybody, right? And then you need to enforce them, which is a whole nother thing because most of us actually do know our limits. We know what we need to do. We know what we should eat. We know when we should go to sleep. We know when it's really too many people in the day to say yes to one more person needing treatment today. And with that, you probably need help, which we'll get to in a minute. And then also, don't hesitate to seek professional treatments. There is such a stigma still on mental illness. Um, and we're working hard to remove that. Um, but we all have tough times. But then we also know when the tough times don't end that maybe it's just not tough times. Maybe there's a depression going on. And that's a real medical condition. And just like with a broken leg, you don't walk that off. Depression, you don't just stop being depressed. That doesn't work. Um, reach out. You have to communicate it. That's what Bill said. You got to communicate your needs. Um, and especially if you have any thoughts of taking your own life. Uh, there are people out there to help and there is a solution and there are better days. Also, um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I was able to keep it together at work, but then at home I became like this insufferable person sometimes. It can spill over into your family. Your work stress can certainly spill over into your family. And so it may create parenting, relationship challenges, all that kind of stuff. Uh, talking to other people about it and really getting a little bit more of an objective um, view of what's going on can help you resolve things when they aren't blown out of proportion yet. And then substance abuse, uh, we have access to drugs as, as providers, and we know that that can be a real challenge. And there is help available. So reach out for help. Now, this item of work-life balance. Um, Bill Clater says the schedule is the biggest source of stress in the dental office. And I dare agree. Um, the schedule can be extremely stressful, right? When you know patients are waiting, when four patients are being seated at the same time, and you know somebody's going to be sitting there for 30 minutes because I can't get to everybody before then. Um, that's stressful. Um, that's the daily schedule. You know, have your team implement perfect day scheduling blocks um, and then also enforce it. And when people show up late, maybe you're not able to see them, but also the weekly schedule. And I wanted to say something about work-life balance, period, because I used to think work-life balance means as little work as possible so you can live your life. And that's not really at all how I see it anymore. Uh, of course, there's a limit. You know, you don't want to be working 80 hours, but you can certainly work many hours. And I still work many hours. But what is that work structured like? Is that life friendly work? Because in the end, work is life, right? You you spend so many hours there. And also that's where we achieve a lot of satisfaction and mm, we achieve meaning and purpose, right? Is through our work. So I decided during my transformation from burnout to not so burnout that it needed to be set up in such a way that Monday was a day I could really look forward to. And Monday was just as fun a day as Friday. Now, that's not true always, of course, but the, the mindset is there where I say, well, work is life. Let's make work life friendly. Um, so that means we have to control the weekly schedule. We have to control the daily schedule and we have to get vacation time. We have to make time for ourselves to do something completely different so we can unplug, recharge from whatever stressors there are inherently in dentistry. And then when I plug back in, I can run full steam ahead without getting to the other extreme of burning myself out right away, right? So really important to cultivate and maintain hobbies outside of your daily routine and work. Uh, maybe outside of your family, maybe with a friend do something, um, something that's completely separate that you do on a regular basis that you look forward to and maybe combine it with some physical and emotional release, um, doing weekly runs with your friend, um, combine some exercise and 
you know, when you have an accountability partner, A, you're going to do it and B, you're likely to enjoy it and, and have a shared experience that you can draw on later and savor later and feel good about later and pat yourself on the back each other, right? And then always giving back to the community is such a rewarding way to um, combine work and, and the rest of your life. Um, allowing those that cannot afford treatment or don't have access to care receive this. And if you've done any free dental days or community outreach efforts, you know just as much as I do that you gain a lot of satisfaction and reassurance from those days. And usually the community gives back to you at least just as much as you give to it. And then spirituality is, of course, a, a wonderful aspect of our lives that we can lean on to achieve balance and a perspective that is greater than our day-to-day -day problems. And we all have day-to-day -day problems, right? Everybody has a hundred problems in their day, whether you are a celebrity or somebody on, who's relying on food stamps for their, for their nutrition, right? And then what's also really, really important is that you recognize your support system and that you utilize them and that you reward them. Um, for example, uh, when I decided I was going to do my exams from the left side, just a simple example, I told my team and then the day got busy and at first I did it and then I was just running from room to room. So then I was like, oh, forget about it. And I just sat on the other side because we had to sit the patient up to move the chair and move the assistant chair and then lay the patient back down. And that alone seemed like too big a hurdle to follow through. So when I noticed that at morning huddle, I said, gang, you got to keep me accountable. I need to do this from the other side. I am struggling with back issues. I have to do some balancing movements. Don't let me get stressed out with a schedule and not hold myself accountable. Please hold me accountable. So some of you may have met me. I'm, I'm pretty tall. I'm six feet tall. And my assistants are like five footers and they're, they're very skinny. So they're very tiny people. So it's so cute when my, my little assistant, when I then rush in and I want to sit on the right side and I'm this dominant person. And she says, doc, would you like to go from the other side? And then she just looks at me and pauses and smiles because we have agreed in morning huddle that when she suggests that I do my exams from my offhand side, I don't get to say no. And so they support me in that way because they want me to be successful because your team does. That's what they're there for. They're there to, to make it all happen and, and see you successful and just ask them for help in the morning. And I didn't come up with that. They, they said, well, we tell you, and then you just say no. And I said, okay, well then don't let me, I, I'm not allowed to say no. So however you want to say it, Whenever you say, do you want to do the exams from the other side? I don't get to say no. And that means you have to define those things, right? You have to talk to them about what your goals are, which means you have some homework to do, doctors. You have to decide where in your life there is a pain point, whether it's physical, mental, or just the schedule or stress at work. You have to determine as a leader where those uh, moments of pain are. And then you can either come up with a solution yourself or better yet, you can just define the goal and let your team come up with a solution with you. Because if you do this together, first of all, you recognize that they have valid input. They would love to be asked. And then once they figure out what they want to do, they will be much more committed to pushing that through than if you just tell them, okay, this is what we're doing now. And this is what we're doing now. And you have to do this and that. And they will see that they are needed and that they are valued, which will really motivate them to follow through. And you will find that the team will bond significantly. So make a plan together, hold yourself accountable. And then that last one, I, want to, I should really write that big as its own slide. Recognize them for their efforts and then create some joy and gratitude every day. Because again, you are the leader. If you create joy and you create gratitude, you set a fantastic role model for everybody else. And they will want to mirror that. And they will. They will help you create joy and gratitude. For example, in Morning Huddle, I have my assistants go over their patients and you know medical history and all that and what we're doing today. And then once they're done talking about all their patients, they say you're grateful. They say what they're grateful for today. Just anything. 
right? And there's a thing, you know, on Mondays, everybody talks about the weekend. And, um, but on Fridays, people don't talk about how they're grateful that it's, that, that it's Friday necessarily. They might talk about how they're grateful, how the other person helped them the other day. And people listen and they're really interested. You know, when I first introduced this, I think it was 2014, I had a little bit of pushback. Um, people were like, oh, this is kind of stupid. I don't know what to say. Well, if you don't know what you're grateful for, let's pause for a second because there's always something to be grateful for. And the beauty is it creates a positive moment and it creates a topic we can discuss throughout the day. Let's say my assistant says, I'm grateful for my husband cooking dinner last night. Then when the patients got their mouth open and here we are working and we want to just have a conversation that's appropriate and, and meaningful, then I can say, hey, you know, you were talking about how your husband cooked for you last night. What did he make? You know, is he a good cook? And we can have that conversation and we can connect with something that's other than office gossip or something else that's inappropriate to talk about. And I find that people, after about three weeks, when somebody would skip their grateful, people wouldn't let them. They'd be like, hey, what's your grateful today? Because they want to know, because they want to connect, because we are people at work and we do want to connect as human beings. So that's really powerful. And that's something you shouldn't forget. Every day when you come to the office, tell at least one person in the office why they're special and why you appreciate them. And you know what? After a few months, it just saturates the office uh, culture and it'll be really, really positive. Okay, so here I have a fun little video. So the stretches that you want to do. Um, first of all, before I show this video, you can see here I'm sitting here and I'm sitting straight for a, a second. Now my, my angle at my hips is a little tight. As you can see, it's a little bit less than 90 degrees. Rochelle is doing well. She's standing next to me. You can see I'm sitting, she's standing. And um, she's leaning forward a little bit, but the issue isn't so much the leaning often, it's the twisting to one side or another and then the bracing. So when you I will show you this video. We literally, this is staged, but we literally stop in the middle of the day to do some exercises here and there. And I have a microphone setting and I can do this over the intercom and people can do it with me. So for example, if you've never done this before, what you can do is you can find a, a, a wall that's clear. It could be a door or something and stand with your, with your head, your shoulders, your uh, butt and your feet touching the wall. So you're, you're backed up against the wall and then take your hands or your arms and bring them out. You can either bring them out straight out or you can, you can bring them out like this where the elbows and the back. So the hands are also touching the wall. Now, if you haven't done this in a long time, just standing there like this will probably make your back muscles talk to you a little bit. Now, once you've, you've done this for, you know, a few seconds and several times in a row, several days in a row, it may seem like normal now to, to stand up the straight. You can do exercises like bring your hands up on the wall. You won't be able to go straight without pulling your shoulders up. So you want to keep your shoulders down just to engage those back muscles behind you. Sometimes also it's nice to clasp your hands behind your back around, uh, you know, your hips there and stretch out the chest because you want to open up the chest. You want to shorten the shoulder, uh, the, the back behind the shoulders. Or you can bring your hands above your head and, and um, interlace them and rotate a little bit to loosen up your shoulders. These are all exercises that are fantastic to do throughout the day because they just tell those muscles real quick, hey, uh, stop cramping up in the front and stop stretching in the back and let's just reset everything and let some blood flow go everywhere. And it'll also give you a breather and patients love it. We literally do this in front of patients and they sometimes do it with us. So we had fun with it. So as a group, we made a video and uh, just for fun, I'm gonna show it here to you. Oh, time for our stretch break. I'm sorry, quick interruption here. What we do is every 90 minutes during the workday, we actually go ahead and take a little stretch break so our backs are healthy. Team team, time for a little stretch break here. Go ahead and do a peacock. What it does is it allows us to really feel better at the end of the day. Go ahead and bring your arms over your head and move on over to the right. And yeah, if you want to, you can do it with us. Won't hurt. And then go on over to the left. Stretch it out nicely. Go nice and lock the weight on your right side. And then let's do a helicopter, fly right. And then we're going to fly left. You can even dance with it if you want to. Here 
even the pregnant ladies can do it. Okay, so what you see in front of you here is a QR code which will link you to the Wellbeing Index. So the Wellbeing Index is that assessment tool. So that's how you can actually uh, check how, how stressed you are, what your level of distress is. It's a free online tool. It's, um, there's uh, now a dentist version of the Wellbeing Index being validated. Um, the Wellbeing Index and the Mayo Clinic partnered with Heartland Dental and our wellness program to assess a bunch of dentists so that we can have a dentist version of the Wellbeing Index. Pretty cool stuff. Um, you can do it as often as you want. Uh, we recommend you do it once a quarter. It's literally seven questions and then two process improvement questions. So there are nine questions total. They're yes, no, or on a scale from one to 10. Um, and it gives you results immediately. And then also there are resources, free resources um, to, to just get some interventions or read some articles about stuff if, if that's what you'd like to do. And um, I find that it just helps me check in and see how I'm doing. And you can track yourself over time. It's a little app that you can download. And then it shows you how you're doing and how you compare to your peers. And I'm actually excited to see um, how dentist wellness compares between the private sector and the DSO sector. So that's something that I'm interested in investigating this in next year to, uh, to get some data. Um, if you have any questions about anything that I've written, um, I'll go over the questions that came in the chat box, but you feel free to reach out to me. You can reach me there at my cell number or my personal email and discuss anything you'd like to discuss. I'm very open to it. I think dentist wellness is such an important topic or dental team wellness. And it's just rising. Um, it's a niche that has not been explored before. And we really, really need it and deserve it. Um, I thank you for your kind attention. And then um, why don't we go over the questions here? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Jockin. I, I loved the, the video. I, it was it, fun. Has it me. gone viral yet? I don't know. It seems like a viral hit. <laughs> uh, it, it, I don't know, but it, it went viral in the dental office. That's for sure for us. It was it, one of those things are great team builders too. You know, people, Tanya did the choreography, somebody picked the music. I mean, it's, it's something to do together that has to do with work, but it's, it's not patient care. And it didn't take long, but the team really loved it. Absolutely. Always important to have a little fun in the work day. Yes. All right. Um, let's see. There's a question about any books that you recommend. I know you covered one, but do you have any others? Yes. I, I mean, I'm, I'm always reading um, right now. What I'm working through is a, a book from Peter Burrow called Core Beliefs that actually tells us why we're reacting to issues that we see in, in our environment and, and what kind of processing system we have which doesn't have anything to do with dentistry, but a lot with how you react to things and how well you lead. Um, goodness, I could, I could talk all day about different books, but when it comes to the, the wellness and, and pausing and making sure you're, you're doing well, I think the positive psychology is an excellent one to start at. All right. Um, can you please mention the website that offers the wellness test? Yeah, that's right here. So. Um, and I think the, so the QR code on the screen will get you there. That, that code will work. Let me just go in. It looks like, yes, my, my wellbeing index.org. Yeah. .org. That's the thing. Yeah. Um, let's see. And um, it's important to note that it's the Mayo Clinic that owns all that data, even though we with Heartland Dental are doing all the research with it. We don't own the data, the Wellbeing Index and the Mayo Clinic own all the data and um, process it in a scientific way to, um, yeah, as many people as want to take it because you, you may even be involved in, in their research project, project that in, included in that. Uh, another great question that came in, do you recommend every 90 minutes for stretches all day? I do, I really do. And it's so hard to do it. It's so hard to, I still have days when I leave and I'm like, oh my God, we never once stretched. And those are the days when you needed it the most. Um, 
but we're we're on and off. So yes, I would recommend every 90 minutes. And you know what? It's little things and you don't have to do them all, all the time. But I am now more aware of when as my shoulder that comes forward as I twist towards the patient, I'm more aware of opening that up. So I might just stand by a doorway and put a little bit of pressure on the shoulder and just breathe. Um, it doesn't take long. It's just a few seconds. Same with one more thing that's a, that's a helpful one. Box breathing. Um, if you feel super stressed and you just have 30 seconds, literally 30 seconds to try and put yourself in a better mindset, try box breathing. Box breathing is super easy. You breathe like a box. You inhale on the count of four. You hold your breath on the count of four. You exhale on the count of four. And then you hold your breath for the count of four. That last count of four, do that three times. It literally takes you less than 30 seconds. And you will find that you come from a high, you know, sympathetic fight or flight response, kind of super high energy mode. It'll jump you into that parasympathetic, cool, calm, collected. I can now make a rational decision without feeling frantic kind of mode. And it does it every time. If you're nervous before a speech, if you're, you know, the box breathing, three rounds of that box breathing, it'll, it'll change your internal set mindset incredibly well. Um, do you usually have your assistants stand? So it really depends. Um, some, I usually sit and sometimes I like the patient higher or lower. I don't always have the patient in exactly the same position. Most of the time they sit, but often they just switch around. So they might sit for part of the procedure and then stand for part of the procedure. Um, I think everybody's really different. Um, I tried standing for a while because I thought it was the sitting because when you sit, your psoas is short. Um, I thought it was the sitting that was the issue. So I tried to stand for surgery and it, it didn't work for me. But I know a lot of people who really like standing while doing surgery. Depends. And when it comes to chairs, let your assistant give input. If a chair doesn't work for your assistant or your hygienist or something, the chair is super important. Even if you need to invest extra money on a super duper chair, it's what they use every day. It's kind of really crucial. So I, I let my assistants, you know, pick chairs if, if they need a different chair. Does stress peak at a particular time of the day? And I guess further in, in the dental practice, if you want to get super specific. Yeah, no, I get it. Good question. For me personally, I'm not stressed out ahead of a procedure agonizing over it. I'm stressed out when my patients wait. And that usually accumulates after lunch. So it's more towards the end of the day. And then as soon as I know that I've been to everybody and I know and everybody's arrived and I know everybody's okay, then actually my stress level goes down. That's me personally. That's just one person. Um, I, but I really do agree with Bill Plater that the schedule is so crucial. Um, don't try and do a root canal while you have fillings next door and then two annuals. It's just, it, it doesn't, well, for most of us mortals, it's just too much. All right. I think, we got, all the, I think we got through all the questions. I'm not seeing anything else. Cool. Yeah, so that's a wrap. So thank you so much, Dr. Jockin, for the really essential information. Nice little uh, positive note to end the day for, for most of us here. Yes. Um, for those of you wondering, we did record the webinar tonight, so we'll get that out to you within one week or so. I'd like to thank ADEC for sponsoring the webinar tonight. And then if anyone would like to attend future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. All right, any questions, feel free to email Dr. Jockin and uh, have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. Have a good night.